Well, it's November 9th, 2009, and we're here at the home of Lorena Weeks in Wadley, Georgia, and my name is Kathleen Clark. And we just, so, we're just really delighted to be here, Lorena. And so to glad be, to have you here. <laughs> really um, thrilled to have you tell your story. So, where would you like to begin? Should we? Well, should I begin? Oh, when I started to work with the telephone company. Sure. I graduated on, on Friday night and caught the train. I was living in Louisville at that time, 10 miles from Wadley. Mm -hmm. And I caught the train, the Nancy Hanks, to Atlanta on Saturday. And Monday, I went down for an interview with Southern Bell. They were at 51 Ivy Street then. And after the interview, they uh, did a physical and put me to work that morning at 10 o'clock. And right here, I would like to say that I have nothing against Southern Belle. I have nothing against men. I have a wonderful husband and son and two brothers that I adore. And uh, I had nothing against anyone. I just felt like this was a point of law that needed to be changed because women were having to take the back seat in so many jobs. And uh, anyhow, let me get back online. I went to work uh, with Southern Bell and worked up there a few months and my mother had passed away and I had my nine-year-old brother and 15-year-old sister and they both wanted to come back to Louisville to go to school. So I made arrangements and we had a one room apartment to live in. In Louisville? In Louisville. And I went to work at the shirt factory because I did not have enough time in with the telephone company to transfer to Wadley. So I worked at the shirt factory in Louisville for about two and a half months. And then... Uh, and you were supporting your... Brother, brother and, sister, and sister, right. Right. And uh, they slept at night and I worked as a telephone operator in Wadley. I did get on in Wadley, there was a vacancy, a uh, night telephone operator, and I worked from 11 at night to 7 in the morning and caught the mail carrier from Wadley back to Louisville the next morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I rode the bus. I didn't have an automobile. I didn't even know how to drive. And I caught the bus from Louisville at night at 8.30. But I, before I went before I caught the bus, I went to work at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and worked until about quarter after 8 every night. At the shirt factory? No, at, 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 uh, at a restaurant. I got, uh -huh. uh, this was another job I had in addition to the telephone company job. And uh, I worked there just for tips and for my brother a meal of vegetables because I didn't have time to cook and do all that. So. That's what I work for the tips and for him to have a free meal. And you were about 18 years old? Mm-hmm. You just graduated, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I worked on as a telephone operator in Wadley for a long, long time. And then they did away with the telephone office, all telephone operators in Wadley. They were either transferred or retired. And there was an opening in Swainsboro, which is 20 miles from Wadley, for an outside plant clerk. And it required typing. It was just um, secretarial work. And I qualified for that and got the job. So I worked there until uh, Johnson signed that civil rights, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act into law. And uh, that's something that they'd been going around in the back of my head. If I ever have a chance at one of these better jobs, better paying jobs, I'm going to go for it. Mm -hmm. So soon afterwards, the telephone company posted a bid. That's how you go up the ladder with the telephone companies by bids. You have seniority plus mm -hmm. qualifications. Well, I, didn't, I wasn't qualified, but they have schools they send you to to train you. So uh, I bid on the, the job. Switchman job? Pardon? This was for the switchman job? Right. It was a switchman job in the Louisville and Wadley 
Georgia uh, central offices. And it, what does a switchman do? Is it well, uh, it's changed so much since I, I was a what they called a step-by-step -step switchman, mm -hmm. where you actually saw your your um, line finder go up and find the group and terminal they were on and go around, you know, all over the office about six steps before a number would ring. They would wind up on a connector, you know, and uh, it, this work required maintaining the troubles and all within the central offices. And it was anything, it was easy work. It was, I mean, a woman could easily do it. So I bid on the job and anyhow, they returned my bid stating that they appreciated me wanting to advance with the company, but it was not a job that was awarded to women. Mm. Well, there was a poster in the central office in all the all the telephone company places on discrimination and to get in touch with Franklin Roosevelt if you feel that you've been uh, discriminated against. He was head of the EEOC. Okay. So I wrote a letter to them and it took several weeks. It came back and I was told in the letter that um, one of the that there was a branch in Atlanta, Georgia, and Keith McDonald was head of it, and that he would be getting in touch with me in the uh, soon, you know, in the future. So sure enough, I think it must have been six weeks or two months later or longer, he did come down and uh, went over the central office in Louisville and went over the one in Wadley. Uh -huh and told the telephone company there was absolutely nothing. He didn't see any reason why a woman couldn't do the job. But the telephone company refused to give me the job. So then... What were you thinking at that point? I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have that job one way or the other. Somebody's going to listen to me if I have to go all the way to Chief Justice Earl Warren and I'm going to sit on his doorsteps. Maybe he'll listen to me. Somebody will listen to me because I was desperate. I knew how hard my mother had worked. She died at age 38. She was left at, when she was 29 years old with four little children. And the day my daddy was buried, my youngest brother was 10 months old, and my mother worked her heart out for us, so I knew that women, that men were not always the breadwinners. So um, I filed a grievance with, uh, with the union when they returned my bid and said that they, they couldn't give it to a woman. And the uh, president of that union told me, he said, Lorena, there's nothing that I have against you, but you know if we let, if we get it where you get this job, there are going to be women all over. And I told him, I said, well, that's, that's what it's all about. Make, it's just not for me, it's for every woman. And uh, he said, well, you know, the man's the breadwinner in the family. I says, oh, no. I know better than that, too. I said, when I check out the grocery store with a loaf of bread, they don't say, well, you're a nice little lady, and you can have that for 50 cents. I said, if anything, they'll charge me more for it. I said, in the same way with uh, getting your automobile worked on so many ways, women are taken advantage of. I said, I've got a mother I know, and I know how hard she worked for what, just to feed us. My mother used to get up in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, go hunting and kill a squirrel or two and come home and dress it for us to have gravy and something to eat at night. Now that sounds terrible, but that is the truth. After daddy died. She did what she had to do. And I have seen her dress a, a pig, a hog. She could do anything. And she'd take a shotgun, she'd go out and she'd kill the birds. And <laughs> but we ate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, well anyhow. Oh. Uh, after the phone company wouldn't let me have the job and the union wouldn't back me in it, I got, in, I, like I said, I got in touch with uh, Washington, D.C., and then Keith McDonald came down and investigated, and they uh, still wouldn't give me the job. And he says, the only way you're going to get it is to go to court. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, good. I'll, 
I'll go to Colbert. Mm -hmm. So I had an appointed attorney in Swainsboro, a local attorney, and um, he didn't know. Well, nobody knew the terminology of the telephone company, the terms that they use, you have to be in the system, I think, to understand it, really. And he didn't understand what was going on. Uh -huh. But the men that testified for me, I subpoenaed them because I didn't want them to, uh, the phone company to come back and, you know, to take, take, um, up something against them and so uh, so that they could say that they needed to testify uh, right so you were thinking and i delivered the subpoenas too right down in the water cafe <laughs> 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 I sure did. I marched right in that cafe. They were all having breakfast, and I think I broke up that breakfast. <laughs> but anyhow, they were wonderful, and all the men respected me, and I said I had rather had their respect than anything else. And and uh, so when they, in district court, when they got up there, uh, when the, they testified, they had pictures of Jerry Hathaway, who got the job that I bid on. And I remember Jerry, and he was a tiny little blonde-haired boy. I mean, I had nothing against Jerry, and he had a good job, and he was trying for a mail carrier's job at that time. Anyhow, I knew that. So um, they had pictures of him up a ladder with this relay timing test set, and I had forgotten it weighed over 30 pounds. And we had a Georgia Rule 59 then that stated, that women and minors would not lift weights in excess of 30 pounds on a job. So I think that relay time and test set was about 30 and three quarter pounds, something like that. Well, anyhow, uh, that's actually what uh, kept me uh, from ha getting a favorable decision, I think, as much as anything. But Jerry was perched up on top of a ladder with that thing just working up a breeze on those uh, connect us and, and uh, line finders and all that. And I had a bell system. Well, it was uh, uh, back then. It was before the company split. It was uh, AT&T. Mm -hmm. uh, a practice that stated that, that under no circumstance would that relay time and test set be used on a ladder because it was an expensive piece of equipment. And there was a little dolly with wheels on it, and it sat on that, and it had the leads long enough to reach everything in the office. Mm -hmm. But yet Jerry was sitting on top of that ladder with it. So they had, they had made up this picture, basically, or saying right. the company uh -huh. had perched him in a position he never would have been in. They were fooling the judge evidence. because he didn't know, and my lawyer didn't know what was going on. And then they came up with that I would have to move this uh, generator, oh, thousands of pounds, this generator, from one office to the other if there was a power outage, you know. Mm -hmm. And Harry Moore, bless his heart. And who was he? He was an installer repairman with the okay. phone company, and he was subpoenaed. And I was so proud of, of his testimony. He said... The switchman doesn't even have a vehicle, and the switchman doesn't put a hand on that generator. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the judge asked, well, well, how does it get from Louisville to Wadley? He said the cable repairman with his heavy-duty truck is the one that moves it around. She wouldn't have to touch it. So uh, anyhow, Judge Scarlett moved, ruled against me. And I went back to the office that afternoon just, oh, I, I was so hurt, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And about the next day, I believe it was, I got a letter from the lawyer that he was getting off the case. So that I was left high and dry with nobody, nothing. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I called the, I guess he's clerk of court in Savannah, and ask him what should I do. I wanted to. I wanted to, to stay in there, you know. And I knew I just had so long. And he told me I would have to have a transcript of the trial, and uh, told me how to get in touch and what to do. And I did that. I got a transcript of it. And then a, a day or two later, I got this call at home, and it was Marguerite Raywalt. 
and I, I told her, I said, oh, I don't know which way I'm going. I said, I've, I've been so upset, and you are an answer to prayer. I said, I have prayed so hard. She said, well, I'm, I'm at the Pentagon, and uh, she was an attorney also. She said, and the papers came back, acro came across my desk that you had lost this case in district court. She said, and I am very interested in uh, women's issues, and now it's getting organized. She said, and we have an attorney, Sylvia Roberts. And I said, oh, Miss Raywalk, you just, you don't know. I do need help. And she says, well, I, I believe she said she would have Sylvia get in touch with me. Uh -huh. And uh, so that's how we got together. And then for about almost five years, it was on and off, on and off, in, in and out. And this uh, was, you had first tried for the job in 1966, right? Was it 1966? That you first tried Johnson to signed the, that act in what, 64? 64. 64. Mm -hmm. Well, it was shortly after that. It shortly must have been 65. 65. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this was, and, and uh, you'd lost in the first court in 60, 66 or? Yes, right yes, uh huh. Then? Yes, and then we appealed. With Sylvia, right? Right, with Sylvia then. Oh, she was wonderful. Tell me about Sylvia. What was she like? Oh, she's smart and a little firecracker. I don't think Sylvia weighed 100 pounds at this time. She is a tiny little thing. <laughs> and uh, just, as feminine as, just as feminine as she could be. Mm -hmm. Just a long black hair, and she didn't even own a pair of pants. She's a little lady. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, my. And we had such good times. Oh. She, was she in Louisiana? Louisiana, then? Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She's okay. still there uh -huh. in practice, and I'm in touch with her every once in a while. She's a very busy little woman. Yes, she is. But anyhow, I went to uh, to a conference in uh, in uh, Los Angeles, California, and Sylvia carried me all over that place. She hadn't been to bed in 26 hours, <laughs> and she was going full speed ahead. <laughs> Well, she sounds like she's a very determined woman yeah, she with a is. strong she, sense of justice. She's smart as she like can you. be. She sure is. And what was that like for your family at the time? What, what did your husband think of all this? Well, I came home really? crying one day. I was so upset. And he mm -hmm. says, now listen, if it's going to upset you like that and you come home crying one more time, you won't go back to work. <laughs> My husband really, at first, he... He told me when I first started with it, he called me Butch. He said, Butch, you know we're going to lose a lot of friends mm -hmm. if you do this thing. And I said, well, Billy, let's look at it like this. Um, if that's the kind of friends we got, we don't need them anyhow, you know. Mm -hmm. If they can't see what I'm trying to do and understand, they know I wouldn't do anything wrong, and I feel led by the Lord to do what I'm doing. And that's the first thing this appointed attorney told me when I went to his office. He says, Ms. Weeks, I hope you know you're fixing to lose your job. I said, well, Mr. Clark, let me tell you like this. I said, I'm not realizing, money-wise, I'm not realizing anything from the job I'm working on. I said, I'm having to commute 20 miles a day. Of course, that doesn't seem, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't seem like very far, but, uh, when you have to buy an automobile to do it and make payments and insurance and all that, it can get pretty expensive. I said, just look at it like this. I'm just getting another day closer to Social Security. I said, I'm not realizing anything from the job. And it's taking me away from things that I wanted to do. I was a Girl Scout leader. I had to give that up. I I was a G8. You had three girls, right? I had two girls. Two girls. And, three, and I've got three grand girl granddaughters and your son as well right mm -hmm. and how old were they when this was going on oh uh, they were still in high school and then bruce graduated and went to college in 67 or 68 and then ours was right behind him i had two to graduate from the university of georgia and then jenny the baby the youngest um uh, went to nursing school until they sent her to the operating room and 
She couldn't take it. She took off to Jacksonville, Florida. She sold her. She sold her cap and bought her a ticket on the airplane to Jacksonville. But now she's uh, she's in her fourth term, I believe it is, as uh, Jefferson County Tax Commissioner. So she's doing all right. That's pretty impressive. But she says, "My." She called me from Jacksonville and says, "Mom, I said, what, Jenny?" She says, I'm at Uncle Edward's in Jacksonville. I said, what are you doing there? She says, well, I've just left nursing school. I said, why? She says, Mama, I just couldn't take any more. I was about to have a nervous breakdown. I said, well, why didn't you come home? She said, because you'd put me in the car and take me back. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that was a pretty good idea. But anyhow, everything worked out fine for her. It sounds like it did. And what were they, so they were teenagers, what did they think of everything that you were doing? Or? They didn't know what was going on, a lot of it, because I didn't bring it home. I had Billy told me, if you come home crying again. <laughs> so I just left it all. When I walked in the door at the house, I left it all, except telephone calls, you know, things like that that I would get. Well, and I don't know how you did it. I mean, you were doing your job. The you good Lord. The good, I, le I felt like about five people, just I couldn't get myself together. Yeah. And I couldn't sleep, and I stopped going to church because um, too many preachers were preaching, you know, about these bad women and all that kind of, and, mm -hmm. and I'm very sensitive, and nobody understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. And they were just getting a lot of flashbacks or whatever from what, what we were trying to do, and I was just trying to make things better. Mm -hmm. So... It must have been hard for you to stop going to church. And oh, it was hard. I was so long. Oh, I was so lonesome. Just, I mean, my life was just completely turned around almost. But I, I knew I, I felt I was doing what the Lord wanted me to do. And our Sunday school lesson Sunday was about God's chosen people. And I feel like God, I'm nothing special. I know that. But He chose me. I could never have done it mm -hmm. if I hadn't had the faith I had mm -hmm. because he held my hand right through it. But there were moments, there were times when things would just go so bad and I'd be so worn out. And I would call Sylvia and she'd always build me up. Mm -hmm. She'd say, you know, that's part of it, litigation. You're tr just being torn down. She said, that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. But I could have reported to EEOC, but I didn't want to keep a term all, all the time, uh, something going on all the time. Because the peop some of your co-workers were... It was the bosses, more the, the bosses. bosses. Yes, the day after the trial, after I lost in district court, my first level supervisor and the second level supervisor were right outside the door, and I left the door. It was still warm weather, you know screen door and uh, they were out there just laughing just having the best time you ever heard over me losing that case mm -hmm. you know so um i was fixing up my disbursement reports and everything that i had to send in every day and i i just hand wrote all of them and put them in an envelope and put them outside mm -hmm. and they call it the mule train the telephone company mule train <laughs> they pick up the mail every day and uh, I put them in the uh, thing to be sent off that night. So the next morning, the first, right after I got to work, the first thing, the second level supervisor walked in and just threw them on the desk. He says, Lorena, is this your writing? I said, yes, it is, Jim. He says, well, I, I said, no, just wait a minute. I said, the way you, you acted yesterday in court, I said, I saw exactly what kind of gentleman you were. I said, now you, I'll, I'm not going to answer anything else until somebody comes in here to represent me. And I said, now get a CWA member or somebody that uh, uh, on my side that I can, I mean, I'm a witness to it. I'm just not going. Mm -hmm. So uh, he turned around to one of the men. He says, well, go get Jack Overstreet. And Jack was out in the, I think he was out all uh, somewhere right outside, I don't know, in the storage room or somewhere out there. He came right on in in a few minutes, and oh, I said, all right, now, Jim, I said, I've got representation. You ask me anything you want to answer, I'll ask me, and I'll answer it if mm -hmm. I know the answer. He says, 
Are they, is this your right? And I said, it sure is. Well, don't you know these forms are supposed to be typed? I said, yes, that's been the usual procedure. He says, well, they're not typed, they're handwritten. I said, I know that. I said, yesterday in district court, I lost a case because I w couldn't lift a 30 and three quarter relay time and test set. I said, now that typewriter under my desk weighs 34 and whatever pounds it was. I said, and I'm having to lift it up and sit it on the desk. It was an old manual typewriter. I said, and I am not going to break Georgia Rule 59 by lifting up that typewriter. He says, all right, young lady, get your things and go home. You're suspended. And that's when I started crying, and I cried all, I cried and cried, because I love the telephone company, and I was being taken advantage of, and from the way they had been laughing and caring on outside, and I heard, I they were just going to get rid of me if they could. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, after Marguerite called me and Sylvia got into the picture, it was just altogether different. We And Judge Bell uh, in Atlanta, Griffin Bell, who was Jimmy Carter's attorney general when he was in, um, is a judge that, that listened to it. We went up when Sylvia got a hearing with him. We went up and... Uh, and talk with him, and gosh, let me see. I... And one of the things that was really important to you is that you wanted to, you filed a grievance, right, after you were suspended? Right. So that, because... Um, yes, you know, I filed the wrong. grievance and uh, won the grievance pay, right? and got my pay, so... You won that grievance? Won yeah. that grievance. That was a real mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. triumph. And then we, after we got the hearing with uh, Judge Bell, he uh, you you had to appeal, right? To and he was the presiding judge mm -hmm. at the appellate level, right? And um, did you take a typewriter into that courtroom? No, I didn't take you it. Didn't take I it just in. Took, but it was there, right? I think it was there. Uh -huh. I relay time and test that everything was in the courtroom because Sylvia lifted up, lifted, you know, some of those things. Uh -huh. Nothing was all that heavy, but that's what they were playing against, you know, was that Rule 59, which yep. got changed right after that. So, But some states had uh, regulations of 12 and 13 pounds for women. Right. To lift. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 12 or 13 mm -hmm. pounds? Uh-huh. Women well, and minors. Cut, out, cut people out of a lot of work. To lift. But anyhow, after Griffin, oh, Judge Bell listened oh, to us and let's see, the three oh, judges had ruled in my favor in the Fifth Circuit, I suppose. And that was in 1969. Mm -hmm. So already it had been going on for quite a few years mm -hmm. that you've been... And uh, Judge Bell told him that day, said, well, uh, I want y'all to give Ms. Weeks a job mm -hmm. because he's the, it's been ruled against and she has one. I want her put on the job. So I left there that day and I was real happy, you know, and I that came back to work and waited and waited and waited and they never put me on the job. Mm -hmm. And I think it might, might have been about six or eight months later we got another hearing with, uh, with uh, Judge Bell. And uh, when I walked in there that morning, he was surprised to see me. He told me I wasn't supposed to be there and uh, just sit over there in the corner, you know. <laughs> I could sit in the corner. I wasn't supposed to be there. And he started talking, you know. Well, he always, he got it all backwards that a switchman with the phone company was like a switchman out there on the railroad. Okay. <laughs> so if if I hadn't been there to explain to them, you know, they, they didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm not all that smart, but I was with the phone company and it, at schools and all that. And I, as long as I'd been with the company, I knew some of mm -hmm. <laughs> what was going on. And they didn't. But anyhow, he, he told us, said, oh, you're just going to have a few minutes of my time. And uh, that's it, that you women and minorities are not going to tap this telephone company. He said that. Did he really? He did. <laughs> so, uh,
Did the, he know that you weren't in the job at that time? No. And oh, the, the second time when I went back mm -hmm. and I told him, I said, well, I hope. I said, well, I, he, that's when he told me I wasn't supposed to be heard, you know. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, well, just let me say this. I hope all of you had a Merry Christmas. I said, because I had one of the worst ones I have ever had. Mm -hmm. I said, my husband, who is a rural letter carrier, was in a wreck and was almost killed. Mm -hmm. I said, and uh, my children, my two daughters, got portable sewing machines for Christmas to make their little blouses and skirts their clothes because we are just drained. We're not able to buy them mm -hmm. clothes anymore. And uh, Judge Bell said, you mean you aren't on the job yet, Ms. Weeks? I said, no, sir, I am not on the job. And he looked at those two uh, Southern Bell attorneys, and he says, let me tell y'all one thing. So there'll be a court order written before she leaves here today, and she'll be on the job in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so I've got that court order somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do. Oh, I was just thrilled to death. God answered, God answered my <laughs> prayers. It was a long time getting there, but they sure were answered for me and for so many more. What an amazing feeling that must have been. Was that it was. Nice? I had that court order on Nancy Hacks coming from Atlanta showing it to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and the train just does uh, slow up good in Macon. And I jumped off the train and called Billy, my husband, <laughs> and the conductor was out there just hollering <laughs> me to come on. <laughs> you were enjoying the moment. Oh, I, I'm telling Absolutely. you, it was just wonderful. It really was. I mean, after all you had been through, mm -hmm. you know, I think for all that was, I think that was 1971. I think you've been fighting for more than five years mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. I and uh, now I was just having all sorts of, I went to so many things and they had standing ovation for me in Los Angeles. And all I did was get up there and say, hey, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a public speaker and I was timid back then. <laughs> Well, they were thrilled. I mean, what you had done wasn't just for yourself, but what it did for, for all women. I mean, yeah. it was an amazing victory. It was. I was on a mission. I know that. But Southern Pale was good to me. I tell you, if it wasn't I, my, that retirement, mm -hmm. they were good to me. Well, then, the, the, you know, they needed to be good to you <laughs> at that point. So you started... Now tell me a little bit about, so you um, you won the case and you got on the job, but then did you need to go to school or did they, were you on the job the next day, mm -hmm. like Judge Bell said? Yeah, they put me on the job the next day and I went to Louisville. I had a report at the uh, office over in Louisville and I got there a few minutes before 8 o'clock and I knocked on the door and I didn't have a key at that time. Mm -hmm. I knocked on the door and knocked on the door and walked around side the building and I couldn't get in and finally Jerry and Johnny Gary, Johnny was an IR installer repairman, came to the door and they said, well you're late. I said, no I'm not late. I've been here knocking on this door for 10 or 15 minutes. So they locked it? They had had the door locked and mm -hmm. so I went in and then everywhere Jerry went, I followed him around. <laughs> he was a switchman, and I followed him. And one thing you know, that I forgot to say, I told Judge Bell, I said, I don't want this job. If uh, I mean, I wanted to win the case, mm -hmm. but I didn't want the job if it meant putting Jerry back outside and taking a cut in pay. I said, Jerry is not responsible for what happened, and I think he should stay on the job. So that, and Jerry didn't even know, he, he didn't know until now that I mm -hmm. said that. But uh, they left him on the job until he, uh, uh, he just resigned, just left the phone company, uh, oh, three or four years later, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And how was, so what was it like with your, with your co-workers that day, did they? Oh, they were, they were all nice to me. They were all, they respected me. I was older than, older than all of them, mm -hmm. than most of them. I was older than all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and little Tommy Austin uh, made Switchman later, and uh, he was like my son. He was younger mm -hmm. than, than my youngest daughter. 
And I don't know, I just loved all of them. And then when I went to school in Columbus, Ohio, well, actually Dublin, Ohio, for the electronic training, when the office mm -hmm. switched, should I tell her about? Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we switched to ESS. And, and what is that? Uh, that's electrical new system, right? Electronic switching yeah. system, ESS. Mm -hmm. Wadley was scheduled for that. So the head uh, man in Augusta came down with the second level man, and they didn't tell me in the office. I don't know. They I don't know if they thought I had it bugged or what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, they took me outside in the car to tell me that that uh, office was being. Oh, cut to ESS, and that I would be transferred to Waynesboro, which is 30-something miles from home, to work in a step-by-step -step office, just like Wadley was then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said that, I felt, I didn't say anything to them, but I knew that wouldn't happen. So uh, then the, oh, uh, the big boss from Augusta called me. I was working over in Waynesboro, and uh, he called me and told me that uh, that I would be posted regular over there. That would be my regular job, you know, the regular place. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't do a thing in the world but pull that court order. Mm -hmm. And I think Sylvia must have reminded him too that that, that that court order said I would work in the Louisville and Wadley offices. Mm -hmm. It didn't say whether I'd be a step switchman or an ESS switchman, it just said mm -hmm. I would be in those two offices. So it wound up, that's the way it was, and they sent me off to Dublin, Ohio for, uh, for my training, and I worked on, and I loved it. Oh, I did love it. You could just type an order in where I used to have to uh, climb up and test all those switches. You could type an order in, and that you'd hear them going click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> Running all over the place testing those uh -huh. switches. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so they were still trying to make things a little hard for you. Mm -hmm. Not well, there the was workers, so, but it sounds like more the supervisors. Well, this is kind of ugly to say, but one of them one day, uh, the cable repairman foreman and then my foreman out of Augusta, the district plant manager out of Augusta, went into Wadley office, and uh, I thought I had forgot to turn the soldering iron off or something, and I went back in the office, and I, they didn't know I was in there, and I heard one of them say, I don't know if I ought to say this or not, but uh, he said, the cable repairman said, well, now, now that you've got her, what are you going to do with her? He said, I'm going to work her ass off. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he said. So see, it wasn't Southern Bell. Mm -hmm. It was these, it was these, they were trying to get brownie points, trying to build themselves up. And the more they downed me, the higher they got on the ladder, they thought. Mm -hmm. So that's who made it hard, was, mm -hmm. was uh, the supervisors. But I could have reported them to EEOC, and it would, I mean, it would have been tough. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, like I said a while ago, I didn't want to keep a commotion mm -hmm. going all the time. And I said, well, I'm strong enough, I can take it. So. Mm -hmm. Were they the ones who didn't give you the right equipment one day as well? Oh, that was uh, Jerry, who was a switchman. He gave me a pair of sunglasses and told me they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were frame glasses. I had to work with them and gave me a, a, a wire cutter that was completely obsolete because it would just it just cut your hands, you know, anyhow. So. And I got my hand, I thought I was doing the right thing, so I was stripping wire with those things, oh, my fingers at the same time, and trying to wear those sunglasses in that <laughs> office. I couldn't see what I was doing. <laughs> was he worried for his job at that point? Was this Well, he didn't know what the outcome would be, and I, d I never did tell him, because I didn't know what it would be either. But I got the job, so I figured they were going to leave him on anyhow. And you were also trying to get your back pay for quite a bit of time, right? Mm -hmm. And that? Well, um, Judge Bell told me that it'd be $16,000 the way he had figured it, I think. Mm -hmm. And all I asked for 
was the difference in my salary and the salary of Jerry, what Jerry had drawn, plus $4 a day commuting pay that I was having to ride up and down the road for about five years. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked for $4 a day commuting pay, and I've forgotten what I asked for a meal a day to eat out. Mm -hmm. and they, and so they came over mm -hmm. with all of it, but we went to Savannah. The final meeting was in Savannah, and Judge Bell ruled on it down there. And so you got it. So I got it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this was, let's see now, when I was looking at some of your papers, I noticed you filed another, you thought about filing another grievance in 1979. This was, I don't know if you can remember what, this was many years, pretty, quite a few years after everything else had been settled. Mm. I don't know if maybe that was when they tried to move you. Was that when they tried to move you down, down to uh, Waynesboro? Maybe. It might have been. Maybe that was what I was looking mm. at. And so how many more years, how many years did you get to work as a, as a switchman? Oh. Or when did you retire? I think I worked about thir 12 or 13 years after that. I retired in 83. Okay. Wow. And you had started working there in 1947. 47. Mm -hmm. So that's. That's quite a career. And Social Security lady, when she figured my Social Security, she said, you must have had one more good job. I said, why? She mm -hmm. said, this is the highest Social Security I have ever seen for a woman. I said, well, I got what was a traditionally a man's job. I didn't go into all the other to explain to her. No, I know you didn't, Lorena. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. What do you think if you were going to, you know, what do you want uh, young women today to know about what you did back then? And well, I didn't, I didn't discuss it with anybody. You know, you can lose a, a case by letting everybody mm -hmm. know what's going on, mm -hmm. and I just sort of kept it quiet. You did. Stayed to myself, became a hermit almost. <laughs> that sounds like it was pretty lonesome. It was Probably. lonesome. But the children came home from college each weekend, and I washed and ironed clothes and got them ready to go back. They came home every weekend. Did they? <laughs> they sure did. They were at UGA? Were uh, they at the University of Georgia? Mm -hmm. Well, they went two years to uh, Middle Georgia. Uh -huh. I, we wanted them to go to a smaller college uh, because they were from a mm -hmm. small town and not put them in with older people, you know, right. that, like at the university. So uh, they went two years to Middle Georgia and then to, well, Bruce has his master's from the university. Okay. So you put all your th children through college. Mm -hmm. When well, I Jenny didn't go because she ran away from nursing That's school. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> well, you kept it all so quiet then, but I think this is, is a story people should know. Mm. You know, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Well, I do want my little granddaughter. I have three little great-granddaughters. I have three granddaughters and three little great-granddaughters. I have nine great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Seems like they should know a little bit about what you did <laughs> for them. I never bragged about it or talked about it. They didn't bring it up. I mean, you know, they don't talk about it, so... They know I worked with the telephone company, and they know I like the telephone company. Well, you did a lot. You really did. And you met a lot of really remarkable people. We were talking earlier about all the people you've met and known along the way. Yeah. Who do know what Through you did. Through now, uh, Aline Hernandez, she wrote a wonderful letter to the president of Southern Bell. And... Uh, Muriel Fox, and I don't know, just um, Betty Friedan, just mm -hmm. Marguerite Raywald. Oh, she was mm -hmm. such a gentle little lady. And Sylvia. Mm. Did you join now? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> that uh, sounds like Sylvia just was really a remarkable person for you to work with. I'm glad the two of you are still in touch. Would it be nice to take a break and then we could maybe talk a little bit more? Would that work? 
forever. <laughs> well, Lorena, I was just thinking about um, that uh, second trial with the, the appellate level. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you remember about um, the way that Sylvia argued, you, argued your case and what kinds of evidence you brought in or you, bring, you brought in the typewriter, right? Or somebody did and what was that? Do you remember or how she... I, I don't remember. Oh, I think we had that in the district court. In the district court, mm -hmm. okay. The relay time and test set and, and all mm -hmm. that because uh, we didn't actually go back into a courtroom. We went into Judge Bell's chambers, just mm -hmm. in his chambers. Oh. And what do you think made the difference in that second time around? Was he just more open-minded? Well, see, we had, I had Judge Scarlett in the district court, and uh, he passed away. And then I had uh, Judge Alexander Lawrence, who disqualified himself for conflicting interest okay. and then that's when uh, Judge Bell came in. He was actually uh, in the Ninth Circuit, I believe, but he came over into the Fifth Circuit mm -hmm. to, to hear this case. And when and he listened to the case and, and do you remember anything that he said when he rendered his opinion? Did he uh, say why he decided on you're in your favor? And you know, I, I, I really don't remember. Time, it, it, it was so long and drawn long out, and I was so tired. And this final uh, uh, decision was handed down in Savannah. Okay. See, I went to Atlanta twice before him and then to Savannah. Okay. When the final decision was, uh, I mean, it was on the pay, uh -huh. on the money, And actually. were you there when he rendered his decision? Yes, uh -huh. You were right there, yeah. Must have been another exciting moment. It was. It really was. The really long road that you had been on at that point. Really. What are some of the different places that you traveled to after um, after everything was over? And I know that you you said you went to Los Angeles. Right. Went to Washington D.C. and uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And you testified in Washington, right? Testified in Washington before the FCC. I was subpoenaed. Okay. okay. Two of those lawyers came down here and talked with me. And then okay. I was subpoenaed to go to Washington. <coughs> Excuse me. What was that like? It was nice. It was cold. <laughs> that was in January. And I thought I'd <laughs> freeze to death up there. It was yeah. really cold. Yeah. And I can tell you something funny that happened. I don't know if you want. Please, I'd love to hear it. It uh, was during the uh, Indians were up there. They were having a case. And uh, my sister-in-law went with me, Beth. Okay. Beth Weeks went with me. And we were on, I suppose, I believe it was Pennsylvania Avenue. Anyhow, we were in this uh, hotel. And uh, when we came in that evening, we went flying to our rooms, you know, and we were right. I've never seen, I, I, well, I haven't been in a lot of hotels, but the, we had the room right at the end of the hall. Mm -hmm. So we rushed in there, <laughs> closed the door and went to bed. And the next morning we got up and we couldn't find the key. <laughs> couldn't find our key. We were looking for it. And Beth said, well, you had it. I said, well, I think you had it. <laughs> so we looked everywhere and we finally found it hanging in the oh, outside. <laughs> <laughs> Outside <laughs> on the door. Oh, how funny. <laughs> oh, I don't know which one of us left it there, but I don't think I could have slept if I'd known it was hanging there all night. <laughs> and so you went, you uh, and you went in and you testified that day. And mm -hmm. we, that's when we went before story. the FCC and and uh, when the judge asked me. Oh, well, what judge had, what judge handed down the final decision? I said it was Judge Bell. He says, Judge who? I said, Judge Griffin Bell, B-E-L-L, -L, like Southern Bell. <laughs> and they all just laughed. <laughs> oh. And that was when uh, 
when I was testifying up there and told how I was sent home, how I was suspended, you know, for not lifting the typewriter. Mm -hmm. And that's when the little uh, attorney, I thought he was going under the table, you know, he just, mm -hmm. he just didn't want me telling that, I don't think. They tried to get that relay time and test set. I kept it tied up for a long, long time. They said they needed it, you know, it was a piece of equipment that they needed and I wouldn't release it. Huh. We had, we had that piece of equipment. And why were they trying to get it back? They said they, Southern Bell said they needed it, you know, to work with because it They didn't want you to use it in your... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See how little it was. Right, right. <laughs> it was, and I, I've got a picture somewhere. It might be over there in those things with it, it sitting is. right next to the typewriter, and it's about half as yep. big as a typewriter. That's a great picture. I have mm -hmm. seen it. That's mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. right. It's about half as big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so they didn't want you to have that. Mm -mm. Uh-uh. <laughs> and I wouldn't turn it loose. I so. bet you wouldn't. So. Good for you. Well, Sylvia was advising me. She she was <laughs> behind it all. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could, um, well, actually, first of all, what about Los Angeles? What were you doing out there? Oh, it was a convention, a Nile convention. Okay. Uh huh. And were you a speaker there? They no, that's that, the time that I... No, they just invited me up on the, you know, stage, and okay. I just said hello and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I told them I was not a, a public speaker, and it just scared me to death to look out there and see all those people in that audience. Mm -hmm. And when I got up there, I couldn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> but you've told your story so many times, and you've told it so well. I mean, I know that I've seen a video... When, we, when I first came here the first time, mm -hmm. you showed me a video mm -hmm. that I think was made up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Is Boston. That, in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was another conference, I guess. No, this was a, done about three years ago. Uh -huh. And they loved the way that you told your story there. It was, oh, it was different women that had been discriminated against mm -hmm. in that, oh, I think she was a professor. She really had a hard time. Mm-hmm. As a professor. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, I also was wondering, um, we don't have to talk too much about this, but I was thinking about, um, if you could talk just a little bit about um, back when you were a little girl, what, what was Wadley like then? What do you remember? Well, actually, um, oh, did you live in Wadley? I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, and okay. shortly afterwards, my parents moved to Augusta. Georgia, okay. and lived there until uh, I was nine years old, and we moved to Louisville, and that's when Daddy was killed, and two and a half months later, Daddy was killed in the sawmill ball explosion, yeah. and left my mother with four children, mm -hmm. and uh, life was hard. We lived good in Augusta. We just, it was just a change from everything. I took dance lessons, and we had a live-in nurse that drove mama's car and mm -hmm. carried us to the, we had four theaters in Augusta and we mm -hmm. never missed a good movie. I mean, we just had a good time. And then after daddy got killed, he didn't have any insurance or anything. Mm -hmm. My mother had to work so hard. And I, nine years old, had to take care of that 10 month old brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then after mama died nine years later, I was left with, with him and the 15 year old sister yeah that what what did your what did your mom do what did your mother do to she had take? never worked for the public never worked out mm -hmm. until after daddy died and uh, the only thing oh uh, was a shirt factory in Louisville mm -hmm. and she worked at that shirt factory five days a week and clerked at a grocery store on Saturday from 8 until almost 11 Saturday night. Mm. But she, we had the same thing to eat every Sunday for lunch. She'd fix those, get up and fix those uh, meatballs and spaghetti. That's what we'd have. And we had a wooden stove and she'd push them back on the back of the stove, you know, and that's what we would have when we came in from Sunday school and church. Mm. Do you remember why why your family moved from Augusta? Yes. Um, Daddy had, uh, let me see, four, four 
four uncles, I believe, and three aunts. My granddaddy was the only one in the family of nine, is what it was, that was married. Okay. And uh, my great uncles and aunts and all were getting older, and they wanted daddy to come down and help, you know, with the farming. And they, mm -hmm. they had everything. They had their own sawmill. Well, that's where daddy got killed, was oh. at their sawmill. And uh, we left Augusta because, uh, the, and the school system was better in uh -huh. Jefferson County, my mother felt like, so. And she uh, made us all repeat the grade we were in when we left Augusta, Richmond County. She made us repeat it because she said it felt like we hadn't learned anything at the school we were going to, so uh -huh. that put us all a little behind, you know, uh -huh. graduating. Uh -huh. So you she, all repeated when you got to to Louisville, or two? Pardon. You so you all started another did the grade again. Mm -hmm. Was that about third grade for you? It was. Mm -hmm. Do you remember anything about the school or your teacher? Or? Oh yes, Miss Sims. Who? Oh, she was just was my third grade teacher, and I just loved her to death. And then when I was uh, Sunday school director, I started a new um, class of mm -hmm. of the people, the handicapped, the ones that weren't able to come to Sunday school. And Miss Sims was my first, was the first one I would visit each time. And she'd teach me the Sunday school lesson. So when I left, I could, you know, teach it to the other whoever I visited. And then my fourth grade teacher was Pauline Weeks. And the fifth grade teacher was Miss Murphy. Sixth grade teacher was Nell Mac. McBride. I remember them all. I loved I them all. You can rem I couldn't remember my teachers. Oh, all. they were so That's good. I, I mean, they were all so good to me. Did you? It sounds like you like school. I love school. And there were only 13 in the class when I graduated. 13. Wow. <laughs> Things have changed, huh? They really have. But we only had 11 grades then. Mm -hmm. Has this, has, has the town changed a lot? A lot, do you think? Since oh, yes. I used to have to walk to school in, on mud streets. We didn't have any pavement. Down, even downtown in Louisville was not paved back then. And we were talking a while ago about um, the REA and all and electric lights. Well, when we moved to Louisville from Augusta, I thought it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen, those those oil lamps that we had to use because we didn't have any electricity. But I soon learned... You had to wash those shades every day, Mama. <laughs> Mama would make us wash those shades every day so they'd be clear, you know. But I, I soon learned that all lamps weren't weren't so cute. Weren't, they weren't so cute after all. <laughs> oh, you really. In that nine year, uh, that uh, ten month old brother, they used to. Ladies would tell Mama's friends would say. I'd walk with him on my hip, you know, hold him on my hip, because he was just about as big as me. <laughs> and they'd say, you're going to be so humpbacked. <laughs> so around that big boy. Mm -hmm. So you were almost like a second mother to mm -hmm. him, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Yeah, because he, he was just a little fellow when Mama died. Were, you, were, were your, was your brother or sisters, were they around during the case? No. Mm -hmm. no. Well, my oldest brother was overseas, and uh, he said he and some of the officers were sitting around the table, you know, watching television, and said, all of a sudden, it flashed me on television. <laughs> he, he said he got up and said, ho hollered, says, well, that's my silly little old sister. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that, Lorena. You never yeah. that. He was overseas. No. And there you were. Yeah, he didn't, he wasn't expecting anything like that. I bet he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was Roger Mudd's. Oh, I think oh, that was okay. a Roger Mudd. Interview. <laughs> He's always called me his silly little old sister. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like you've been able to stay close. He picks at me. He picks he's always at the family reunion. Oh, he's, he, he says, my grandbabies are prettier than your grandbabies. He just, <laughs> he's on to me all the time, arguing and just cutting up, just having fun. Well, that's a 
a good brother for you. Yes, he is. I looked up to my big brother. I remember when I started the school, I remember what I wore to school. It's a little yellow dress. I remember it just as good because I outgrew it and had to give it to my sister Betty, and it made me real mad because that was one of my favorite dresses. And um, they told me, Mama was telling me what to do at school, you know, the first day. And when the bell rings now, you just, uh, you go out and stand out there at the flagpole and your brother will come out and get you and y'all come on home. But they forgot to tell me they had recess and had the bells, you know, so. <laughs> recess, I went out and stood by the flagpole. And I was standing out there just crying and crying because it had been a good while and my brother hadn't come and I didn't know where he was and everybody was gone and there I was. And they told me that was recess, you know, there'd be another bell. So I looked up to him and he came after me. Do you remember what what it was like for you when you started having to take when you when you were senior in high school and your mom passed away and you were taking care of everybody? It was rough. Well, actually, um, I live with uh, friends. This very good friend of mine, and I talked with her. She's the one I was telling you about. Was just so happy that. Mm -hmm about everything and uh, I lived with Jean. She was Jean Rivers then and she married a doctor from Augusta, Dr. Cherninsky. Jean Rivers Cherninsky. And uh, I lived with her until, until I finished, till I graduated. We were very close. We grew up together, you know, when I came from Augusta in the third grade on through school. And we, I talked her into going into nursing and that we had been accepted. That's what I wanted to do. But then after Mama died, you know, the plans just didn't go through. So right. then I tried to make a nurse out of my youngest daughter, right. and that didn't go through either. <laughs> Jenny ran away from nursing school. So, <laughs> but now she's tax commissioner and, and enjoying it and mm -hmm. doing real good. You've really accomplished a lot. Mm hmm. With your children and your your work and your case, that must have been something. Having all three children were born within how many years apart? Are they? Oh goodness, there's just one year and twenty eight days difference in the oldest and the wow. middle, Iris, and then there's sixteen months difference in wow. Iris and Jenny. Wow. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I've got one right now, sixty one fifty nine, and one. Jenny will be 58 in January, I believe that's right. How did you do it? <laughs> oh, I just loved it. I wanted four, wanted two boys and two girls. Oh. And I just never could have the <laughs> my other little boy. I wanted Bruce a brother. But he and Jenny are so close. Mm -hmm. He eats with her every night. And when he gets, you know, you met him. Yeah. He gets up and he says, well, baby sister, I sure did enjoy that. Because <laughs> <laughs> mm. the baby sister. But you were working, were you, were you working the whole time or did you take some time off? When they were, when born, they were born? Oh, mm -hmm. I took uh, leaves, maternity leaves. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I was out um, almost five years after, you no, know, three years after Jenny was born. I waited until she could pick up the phone and call me if something went wrong. Oh. We had a manual office and I was a telephone operator mm -hmm. and uh, we wore those old things that fit down on your chest, you know, and I think over your head. And the lights would come in on the board and you'd just, you know, plug in it and uh -huh. answer. And when my light would come up, our number was 241, uh -huh. and none of the operators would answer it. They knew, you know, it was for me. And uh -huh. I mean, that's just the courtesy. We didn't answer each other's calls. Uh -huh. And I, w I didn't go back to work until I knew Jenny could pick up the phone, you know, until she could talk. Uh-huh. And, and so she could just call oh, you, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and that's how, and that's how you were able to go back to work, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's, you were still, that's still doing a lot, when, to be back at work and have mm -hmm. three young children like that. I worked hours, though. Oh. I uh, managed to get a trick. Nobody else wanted, that's what the trick was, uh, split hours from oh. 11 until 2 in the morning, and oh. Uh, let me see, 11 to 2, and 7 until 11 at night. Huh. 
I worked a split trick, and I could uh, take them to school in the morning because I didn't go to work until 11. Then I got off at 2. I could pick them up at 3.15. Uh -huh. And then I could give them their supper uh -huh. at uh, 6 o'clock, and I'd go back to work at 7. And Billy would be home by then, my husband. Okay. And he, he would uh, keep them, and I worked until 11 at night. Wow. And I did that for years and years and years. <laughs> Well, you have, uh, that's a remarkable, <laughs> I didn't even, I've never heard of that before, to have a split, you call a it split a split trick. Split trick. <laughs> split trick. Wow. 11 to 2 and 7 to 11. But the worst trick there was was 1 to 10. That was the longest hours. And sometimes on Sunday, I would have to work 1 to 10. Something. Was that 1 in the morning or 1 in the one in, afternoon? 1 in the afternoon until 10, until 10 at night. night. Mm -hmm. That would be hard. Do your daughters know a little bit about the case now? Do they ask you questions? They don't ask me questions. We don't talk about it. Talk about it. Because mm -hmm. I know teenagers, they might not, you know, when they were teenagers at the time, they probably were. Well, I didn't want to embarrass them right. anyhow by telling them a lot. I just mm -hmm. got a, a nice letter from her, uh, one of the professors up at the University of Georgia, you know, congratulating her on her mom's that. success. And, mm -hmm. They were so busy with their little doings, and Iris was a little socialite. She was a <laughs> cheerleader. <laughs> she was a uh, homecoming queen in high school in Wadley, and then Jenny was homecoming queen, too, and Iris crowned Jenny. Mm -hmm. And then when Iris was at Middle Georgia, she was a cheerleader down there. And, uh, of course, when she went to the University of Georgia, she fell in love, I think, or something. <laughs> Anyhow, she, she was just having herself a good time at college, really. Mm -hmm. I hope she doesn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope maybe they'll watch this interview someday. I think that they mm -hmm. would, it would be great for them to know about everything that you've done. <laughs> I bet they would love to, to know about it. Mm -hmm. They were good children, though. We were really blessed with three good children. Mm -hmm. Bruce is a Gideon now. Mm -hmm. he, and he's at some church every weekend just about mm -hmm. and speaking. As a matter of fact, he used to speak. He and Wadley at the Methodist Church, the 15th, I think it is, if that's a Sunday. Mm -hmm. That might be this, you know, today's the 9th. He's supposed to speak this weekend mm -hmm, at the Methodist Church in Wadley. Sounds like, sounds like your husband, sounds like Billy really, uh, well, you were going to tell a story about when you met, actually. You could tell Oh, goodness, I hate and for people to see, know that, but I'll tell you how. You don't have to tell a story if you don't want to. Well, it's really, it's really right comical. I was night telephone operator, and I'd come down, you know, and get off the bus, and Go on to the um, telephone. Go on to the telephone office, and I'd have to sit there a good while, you know, before it was time for me to go to work before eleven. So one night, this nine one zero three, which was a pay station, came up. <coughs> excuse me, on the board, and uh, I answered it, and it was Billy. And he says, "I've been watching you," said. <laughs> I saw you sitting in the cafe eating a piece of apple pie. <laughs> That's how he, he knew who I was. I didn't know him from Adam's house cat, even though we both we had the same last name, you know. So that went on for about uh, two or three months, and I never saw him. I didn't know what he looked like or anything, but he'd call me every night from that payphone, 9103, and talk with me for an hour or so while I was doing tickets. I had to <laughs> do the tickets every, uh -huh. every night, the long-distance tickets. So finally I got tired of it, and I went down to the theater. We only had one in one, the PAL Theater. And this friend of his came, I was standing out in the lobby, and this friend came through, and I knew his friend. And uh, I asked him, I said, Elisha, is Billy Weeks over there in that cafe? It was right next to the, to the theater, to the picture show. And he said, yes, he is. I said, will you take this dime and go 
and give it to him and tell him to bring me a package of potato chips? And he said, all right. So in a few minutes, here comes this big old thing, <laughs> just grinning from ear to ear. And that's the first time I'd ever seen Billy that I, that I know of, that I can recall that I'd ever seen him. <laughs> so, and you got married pretty soon after? Or? Oh, that was, no, about eight months later, I believe uh -huh. it was, we got married. And how long were you married? We were married 50 years in October, and he died the 12th of January. Mm. 50 years. Well, are there any things that people feel would like to, to ask? Is there anything we haven't asked you that you want to, that you want to tell question. us about? Oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think things have changed since the time you had your case for, for women, or do you think there are challenges still there? I think they're still having a hard time as far as the money part goes. But of course, uh, I had a, uh, I guess he was just a lawyer to tell me that he mentioned my name several times a week, you know, in, in uh, cases that he was trying. Hmm. So if the women know enough about it, you know, they, they can file something, you know, and get things worked out, I think, because the law's already, it's already there, but I think there are a lot of them that still don't know about it, maybe. I don't know what mm -hmm. the problem is. Mm -hmm. I think that's definitely part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we all have a lot to be grateful for with you, though. <laughs> I have a lot to be grateful that the Lord picked me, I feel like, and led me, held my hand. And any women will just have faith in, in the Lord and faith in themselves and try for something that they know they can do. Don't just try for something because they can, you know, but for something, be sincere about it the work that they know they can do, I think they can, they'll get the jobs or whatever. All right. Marnie, you did such a nice job. Thank you. <laughs>